Greetings, greetings, greetings. Welcome to So Much to Talk About. My name is Nabate Isles, and it's always a pleasure to share facts and viewpoints on the world of sports. This week is no different. Before I introduce this wonderful individual, please make sure to go to my YouTube channel to check out past episodes of So Much to Talk About. It's N is in No, S is in Sam, I is in Indigo, NSI World. So you can be able to see past interviews and, and conversations that I've had with uh, tremendous individuals in the world of sports and society and music as well. So um, this gentleman, uh, introducing is uh, someone I have a lot of respect for, and he's well respected throughout the entire industry. Uh, he's one of the preeminent writers and columnists in all of sports, writing for numerous newspapers around the country. He's written for uh, the Washington Post and the Boston Herald, to name a few. And he has been senior writer for ESPN.com since 2007 and has served as sports correspondent for NPR's Weekend Edition Saturday since 2006. He authored nine compelling books on a myriad of topics emphasizing race and sports. One of those books was about their recently departed Henry Hank Aaron called The Last Hero, A Life of Hen Henry Aaron. And his latest book, Full Descendants, Notes from an Uneven Playing Field, which features nine powerful essays from different perspectives about inequalities and illusions that Black people have had to deal with in America. It is my pleasure to introduce the one and only Mr. Howard Bryant on So Much To Talk About. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? It's good to be here. Oh, great. I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for, for being here and uh, looking forward to getting receiving your insight and for the audience to hear your insight as well. Uh, so, sir, how have you been, you and your family, been dealing with this pandemic, especially with the changes that it's made in all of our working routines? Well, I think that like this for everybody, it's been extremely difficult, especially you know, obviously you feel very badly for the kids who haven't had a high school experience or haven't had the type of college experience that you expect when you, you know, enter, you know, university. And it's a, it's been devastating for a lot of folks. I think that, I mean, for me personally, it's no, it's no worse than it's been for anybody else. Obviously you feel, you know, a great deal of, of respect and compassion for people, all of us who have lost people over the past year. And I just think that, um, you know, the people that I really feel a, a, a lot of um, compassion and sympathy for the, you know, the, the kids who haven't had the experiences that they, this is supposed to be their prime years. And then also those of us who have lost people, but did didn't get a chance to say goodbye properly because of COVID protocols and being unable to to uh, to hold mass gatherings, funerals, etc. So it's been difficult for everybody. Wow, wow, that, that definitely has been uh, for sure. And uh, I'm glad that you're safe, though. You know, you and your family are safe and everything uh, overall. And it's something that now, hopefully, there'll be a new horizon. Uh, coming up within the mm -hmm. next six months to a year uh, for sure. So, but uh, wow. So Howard, I wanted to. Um, get into, you know, of course, we had the, um, the murder of uh, Dante Wright in Minnesota, and it happened basically 11, th 11 months after the murder of George Floyd. And um, what's been really interesting throughout this pandemic, like a lot of athletes have really been speaking out more and more now, but basically over the past a decade or so, but now it's really been evident with what's been going on. So talk about how athletes can be able to make that change, not just by speaking, but what actions can they take in, in facilitating, that, facilitating that change with their power? I think that one of the biggest things that the athletes have had to deal with is the, the I think what maybe the best way to say it is, I think that the players simply haven't they have, have enormous amount of power. They've always had an enormous amount of power in terms of their visibility. And you hear them talk about it all the time about their platform. 
But I think that the area where you recognize or where they recognize that they had to find ways to be more impactful and to do more is after last year, after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, their, and Jacob Blake and the other things that were happening, I think, I think that they reached a point where they couldn't see a pathway for themselves as being impactful. And for all the different talk about being involved and all the different talk about using your platform, all this stuff keeps happening. And I think that last year, we saw them take another step when Naomi Osaka chose not to play at the Western and Southern Open last year. And then the Milwaukee Bucks and the Orlando Magic didn't play and then the Brewers didn't play. And so you saw something that you hadn't seen before in the history of the modern game where you had a, essentially a coordinated walkout on the part of the players. And so that was one step that created um, a demarcating line because remember, you know, six years earlier, the players had an opportunity to do the same thing over Donald Sterling and the players threatened to walk out, but they didn't. They trusted Adam Silver. They trusted the establishment. They trusted everyone to do the right thing. And the NBA, they got Donald Sterling out of there and it prevented essentially a boycotting of playoff games. This time around, it was, they decided not to play, that there was no negotiation here. Obviously the negotiation took place after where, you know, President Obama, you know, urge the players to go back to work. And when that happened, I had said to myself that we're going to find out now, we're going to find out the limits uh, of what player power can be. We're going to find out what the athletes, how the athletes respond to societal questions that are demonstrably larger than they are. What will they do? We've seen the players act as though, you know, they can use their millions and make a phone call to some congressman and get a photo op and to get attention, but now what, then what? And now you have the election take place, you have January 6th happen. And now, you're, now we're here again at this same spot. We're at this spot where we're talking about the voter, uh, you know, about the voter suppression laws in Georgia. We're here in this spot now after Dante Wright. And, it, and it's gonna be a real challenge for the players because they're finding out that level of hopelessness that the rest of us feel that you can't just go and, and change things, um, even if you are LeBron James, that mm -hmm. there's always gonna be a reaction to what you do. You go down there and the Atlanta Dream goes out there and they get Kelly Leffler booted out of, the, uh, out of ownership. She loses the election. LeBron James and his group is getting all kinds of uh, you know, accolades for their more than a vote campaign. And then this happens, then in response to that, you have a, a massive voter suppression law being passed in the very place where you had your triumph. So it tells you that there's a constant battle that's taking place. It tells you that there's always going to be a response. So while you're celebrating, the other side is mobilizing to, to devalue and to neutralize what you've done. Yes. So now you multiply that with Dante Wright being killed. And now you also see the video in Chicago yesterday um, about the young 13 year old boys, you know, Toledo being killed. Mm -hmm. And so what is that going to do for the athletes? What are they going to do? Are they going to say, well, we tried, we did our thing and now we're going to go back to work. Are they going to figure out different strategies to stay involved is, you, you know, now we're seeing that players are essentially taking days away from playing I, you know can you you know if you did that are you going to you know not really boycott but you're just not going to play whenever these things happen so the players are in a really interesting space right now to to find themselves not just as athletes obviously but as citizens and i'm very interested in seeing what they do with this time because i think we spend a lot of time talking about all the things they can do but i also look at this and i see that they're, you know, they are in the middle of a, of, a, of a battle where they are actually underdogs in terms of trying to beat some of these systems. Well, that's, that's deep because it doesn't matter how much money 
you know, you have this yeah. it, that color of that skin, that that melanin. You know, that's that's at the end of the day. Um, well, it's a great point, uh, uh, Mr. Brian. I'm here with the great Howard Bryant, a senior writer for ESPN.com, as well as one of the preeminent authors in sports and society uh, that we have around. So, um, wow. So, Howard, speaking of what's going on with Georgia, now the Atlanta Braves, well, Major League Baseball made the decision to move the All-Star game from Atlanta, and they moved it now to Denver, Colorado. Um, and, and it's based on that voting law that you uh, mentioned. Um, but the Braves organization seems like uh, they're, they're not condemning the law. And also, Mr. Hank Aaron was a stature and a fixture for that entire organization, but they're not really saying anything. And Brian Snicker, the manager, was a mentee of Mr. Hank Aaron and has not said anything about what's going on. So what is your take on that, about how the Braves and, and Snicker have handled uh, this law and everything and, and are disappointed with Major League Baseball moving the All-Star game? What are they supposed to do? I mean, this is what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. You look at what the, the, the problem that we have with these conversations mm -hmm. is the idea, and I don't, and I really dislike this. It really does bother me because I think it's, it's, um, I think it's incongruous. I think it is, uh, it doesn't, it, it really does not square with the realities of what we're faced with. And that is why are we assuming that these sports leagues and these organizations are on the part of the, the part of the solution, that they're on the side of good, that they are somehow some sort of moral authority. They're not. The Atlanta Braves could have said something in the run-up to this law. They never said anything. So why would they say something now? Why are we expecting them to somehow share the same values that we share? And I think this is something that why the reason why I say it bothers me is because this is fantasy. This is the fact that we want sports to be on our side. We want sports to support us. Sports are just businesses, just another business. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be your entertainment. You may really enjoy it. And, you know, you may have a picture of Dominic Wilkins on your wall, but these are just businesses. And as businesses, they are making decisions that are rooted in what they feel is best for their individual circumstance. So one of the reasons why I was talking about this law, SB202 in Georgia, is to say, okay, even if the law is, even if the, the, the game is changed and it's moved over to Colorado and it's going to Denver, do not assume that the Atlanta Braves or Major League Baseball are somehow allies in the, photo, in the, in the fight against voter suppression, because they're not. Mm -hmm. I don't hear anybody at Major League Baseball saying we're committed to not only, you know, we're committed to the repeal of this law. They haven't said that. They haven't, they haven't said that we've vetted other states and we don't want this to happen in other states. They haven't said anything like that. What they did was they realized that having this event in Cobb County at this moment was bad for them. And that just happened to align with what we believed was doing the right thing. But let's not assume that Major League Baseball is some ally in, in the values of anti-voter suppression laws because they're not. They have suggested that they are disappointed in anything that, that curtails the American right to vote, but they're not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. they, did, they made a business decision that was good for them, which is good, which is, which is progress, which is something that you should do. However, let's also not forget that the National Football League made a decision that they felt was good for them in banning Colin Kaepernick because the you know because criticizing of the idea of criticizing the flag was unpopular. So it's two sides of the same coin. This side just happened to flip in the direction of people who think they're on the side of justice. But five years ago, when the NFL decided not to deal with Colin Kaepernick, they were making the same calculation. This is unpopular. It's bad for us. We need to get out of this. We need to not be associated with this. And so they sacrificed their values because they didn't want to be on the side of the unpopular, even though the unpopular was actually the moral. It was the moral position to take. So I'm always very, very skeptical of taking these issues a little further than they need to go. And I, 
you know, I think that is it progress that Major League Baseball responded in this way? Absolutely. Two years ago, they still play this game. They still play the game in Atlanta or in Cobb County. There's no doubt in my mind about that, that that game doesn't get moved. Post George Floyd, now they realize that you couldn't do that. So mm-hmm. let's just call this for what it is. Mm, deep. Wow. And, uh, and speaking of um, Major League Baseball with what's going on uh, now, it's around 8%, estimated 8% of uh, black players in major league baseball. And, um, and you know, the last three decades of the 20th century, we saw like 18%, 16 to 18% numbers like that, that are high. Um, What would you do? Like, how would you create an initiative to get more African American players involved in major league baseball? What, what would be your blueprint? Well, well, I mean, I think that the very first thing you do is something that's never gonna happen, right? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to identify the real issue, right? Mm -hmm. And right now we also live in fantasy. We spend all of our time saying that the reason why black kids aren't playing baseball is because baseball is too boring or because they prefer basketball or they prefer football. Mm -hmm. This is a money issue. Mm -hmm. This is a money issue across the board and this has been happening your entire life. I don't even know how old you are, but I know by looking at you, it's been going on your entire life. This has been going on my entire life and I'm older than you are. So since the 1960s, Major League Baseball has made a massive, massive physical investment in the Dominican Republic. They put their money there in development. Is it any shock that that's where the players are coming from these days? Yeah. They've well, Puerto Rico, massive, Venezuela, all those. Mm-hmm. No, they've made, in the Dominican Republic, of course, they've made a massive divestment from scouting in inner cities. And from developing the game, the game is outpriced in the cities now. It's a, it's a travel sport now. So when you follow the money, you'll find the players, right? The reason why you don't have a lot of black players coming out of baseball is because baseball is a non-revenue sport. So you're not getting, the black kids aren't necessarily getting money to play college sports the way they're getting money to play college football and college basketball. So to me, now that you've identified this issue, what are you going to do about it? Right. So what you really should do if you're serious about this issue, but baseball is really not that serious about the issue because of what it would take is that you have to reframe your entire business and they're not going to do that for black people. Right. They're mm-hmm. not going to do that for anybody. Mm-hmm. If you really want to solve this problem, you have to give more control to the teams over African-American players in the United States. And as long as you have a draft, that's not going to happen. There's no incentive to develop black baseball players in this country. The reason why you develop black baseball players in the Dominican is because you can control them. If I'm the Boston Red Sox, I know where my money's going. I know that I'm going to invest in the number of kids that I sign. I put them under control. The ones that pan out, they can play for me. In the United States, the New York Yankees have no incentive to develop kids out of Harlem to play baseball, except out of charity. And business isn't about charity because Mm -hmm. every black kid that the New York Yankees or the Mets go into Harlem or Bed-Stuy or wherever to develop those kids, those kids then can get drafted by the Red Sox or the Angels or the Astros. So Mm -hmm. as long as you have an academy system in the Dominican Republic and in Venezuela, where those players can be controlled by the teams and the teams have incentive to to develop them, that's where the money's going. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And as long as you have a draft in the United States and you have college sports that aren't paying you to play baseball the way they're paying you to play football and basketball, there's no incentive to develop African American kids here. It's mm-hmm. numbers, it's money, it's just money. And it's always been money. And instead of talking about the actual financial revenue stream, the financial web that is taking place here. Instead, we just blame the kids and go, oh, well, you know, they just find baseball boring. It's not what's happening. If you put a ball in front of a kid, they'll play with it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Russell Wilson, baseball player. Look at Jameis Winston, baseball player. Mm -hmm. Look at Kyler Murray, baseball player. Mm -hmm. But where did they play? Football. Why? Because they got more resources to play football. Mm. It's really not that complicated. However, what is complicated is the solution. And can baseball by itself go into the NCAA and inject, infuse money in there to give, you know, more scholarships? 
Probably not, because you've got all kinds of other things that go with Title IX and everything else that they have to deal with. But I don't see why they can't give money to Title IX too. But there's that, okay? <laughs> Are you going to get rid of the draft to give black, you know, I've always told, I told Bud Seeley this and I told Sandy Aldis this years ago. If you really want to do this, then you create an academy system in the United States where the teams have incentive to develop. So the LA Academy in Compton that the Dodgers and the Angels get to have those players. Otherwise it becomes charity. And what I mean by charity is it means, okay, we're all gonna put money into this thing because it's the right thing to develop African-American kids. But from a business standpoint, we don't get anything out of it except to feel good. It's not gonna work. Hmm. You know, if you're, the, if you're the Dodgers and there's some kid down on Crenshaw who's the next Willie Mays, you want him playing for the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna be like, oh, well, it's the right thing to develop him. So then he can play for the Padres, but then he can mm -hmm. play for the Angels, he can play for the Giants. That's not how it works. But baseball system, is not going, to, no American system is gonna get rid of the draft because the draft is the way to control people. So, you know, the bottom line is you either have to develop the players, but you, you know, you have to give them money. It costs money. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. Here with senior writer for ESPN.com, Mr. Howard Bryant on so much to talk about and uh, what powerful answers you're giving. And, and uh, Howard, I was thinking like, this is something where former athletes, current former current athletes and former athletes have just retired because you know, of course, money, the salaries have gone up more and more. Um, but can't former athletes like be able to combine their resources like in a situation to get more baseball academies so they can be able to groom kids themselves to give them an opportunity and also can former athletes do the same when it comes to building institutions, not just schools for education, but financial literacy and things like that and community and history. Like, like, can this be done? And do you see it being done in the next 15 to 20 years as our athletes begin to become more and more closer to being billionaires? No, I don't. Mm. And I'll tell you why. But I think that the mistake that we make when we're talking about athletes and wealth is not to compare. You cannot compare the player to you. Compared to us, LeBron James has a lot of money. How much money does LeBron James com have compared to Jerry Jones? LeBron Warren James isn't Warren worth a billion dollars. Jerry, mm -hmm. Jerry Jones is worth 10 times what LeBron is worth. Mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos is worth 50 times what LeBron is worth. Warren Buffett is worth 40 times what LeBron is, whatever. So you start looking at these numbers and the numbers, the economic numbers are staggering. Mm -hmm. Like the difference between a million and a billion dollars, you know? So when you start looking at the actual raw dollars of what it costs to do these things, like when people would say, oh, well, you know, these athletes can form their own leagues. No, they can't. No, they can't. They've got a lot of money. They don't have that much money. They got no TV contracts. They've got no infrastructure. They've got no brand name, right? I mean, they may have some talent, but you know, all of those things are incredibly difficult to build in the face of existing infrastructure, which is why one of the reasons why you look at the athletes now and they're trying to buy into the current situation instead of trying to create a rival, right? Which is why LeBron's got a you know, percentage of the Red Sox and a percentage of Liverpool and Serena Williams has a percentage you know, she's got 2% of the Miami Dolphins and Derek Jeter's got 4% of the Marlins and Magic Johnson's got 2% of the Dodgers. But people made a big deal when Magic Johnson bought into the Dodgers and that he comes in and he goes into his checkbook and he writes a check for $50 million. And people go, ooh, 50 million. They go, wow, right? Magic showing his power. The Los Angeles Dodgers in that sale sold for $2.3 billion. And Magic wrote a check for 50 million. That's 2%. Mm -hmm. That's not real wealth when we're talking about what it takes to actually own things. So to me, the real conversation to be had is to still recognize that despite their hundreds of millions of dollars, the players are at a massive disadvantageous position against real billionaires. Mm -hmm. I mean, you take Oprah Winfrey is the richest black person in this country. 
right? Mm-hmm. Or her or Robert Smith, they go back and forth. I think Robert yeah. Smith is probably richer. I think he's at six million, six billion, six billion. Over around three or four, mm-hmm. right? So either way, they're, they're like the two richest black people. Those two black people combined are like 30 times or 40 times poorer than Mackenzie Bezos. And she got her money from getting divorced. Divorced, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. like when we're really talking about raw dollars here, it's important to have put it in perspective. So yeah, Carmelo Anthony's got a ton of money. He's got nothing compared to the people who actually own these teams and what it actually costs to buy into these teams. Mm. So to me, the real issue isn't asking the players to put in their personal resources. The real issue is trying to figure out a strategy to either feel more invested in this or to find a way to divest completely from it right because i feel like one i feel like money money is the one thing that we know that sports will give the players i mean they'll pay you but how much control are you actually going to get very little how much power are you actually going to have very little and so at the end of the day as romantic as it sounds because the players have all these resources their resources pale in comparison to the actual machine that they are part of. And it's just, I mean, just look at the raw numbers of it. Yeah. Wow. And uh, Howard, two more questions for you. Uh, Wow. Just powerful information, powerful perspective that you're providing. Um, Mr. Hank Aaron, one of my all time favorite individuals and, and someone that you brilliantly wrote about in, um, in his uh, biography and, and it's called The Last Hero, A Life of Henry Aaron. What was one fact that you learned that, that truly uh, was like, wow, this is fascinating. That surprised you in your research on his life? No, well, there are too many to count. I mean, obviously his life was enormous. And I think that, um, and it's a huge loss. It will always be a huge loss. I think that when I think about Henry, I mean, I mean, it depends. I mean, if you talk about him as a player, I mean, there are just, once again, so many different <laughs> things as a, as a player, people love the stat that if he never hit a single home run, he would still have 3000 hits. That's an amazing statistic. Mm-hmm. I think it's an amazing statistic with Henry that, you know, when he first came into the big leagues, he wanted to be the all-time leader in hits in the national league, 3,360. That was the, um, I'm sorry, 3,630. That was the record that he was, you know, that he wanted to break. And then in mid-career... Stan Musial. Stan Musial. Yeah, it was Stan Musial's record. And midway through his career, he pivots and goes after Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. And I just think how good you have to be, you know, to choose which records you're going to pursue. That's an an enormous amount of talent. Um, Obviously... And and the total bases. Oh, my goodness. Everything, exactly. (laughs) He's just... He's a machine. His ability to play that game was just staggering. His ability to you know, to do the things that he did. Uh, I feel like off of the field, obviously, you know, just an enormous, enormous figure. I think that um, even just from a business standpoint, the fact that he was the, you know, he owned the first BMW dealership and and you know the first one for an African American in this country. Um, the fact that he you know, really was a person of just enormous value. I just love Henry's values and um, yeah, really a good person. And there just really aren't that many good people out there where you just look at them and they walk the walk. And, you know, I know it's a, it's a bit of a vague answer, but there's just too many to count with him. I think one thing that I really enjoyed about Henry as well was the fact that um, here's a, a, a man who, you look at when he when he went to Eau Claire, Wisconsin as a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, he'd never had a full conversation with a white person before mm. because of how deep the segregation was. It wasn't supposed to, they weren't supposed to speak to each other. So the people don't realize what that actual life was like. And they don't realize the depths of what the of what segregation did to people. And the fact that he, his talent alone placed him in this world of navigation and essentially created a new life for him is really stunning. 
Oh, absolutely. And uh, last question for you, sir. Uh, thank you for your time on being on so much to talk about. Yeah, it's my uh, pleasure. Yes, sir. Um, now, the most unpredictable, memorable sports event that you've covered in your vast career. Like, what's that one event that you still like, it brings a smile to your face or you're just like in amazement. Like, I can't believe I just saw that. <laughs> I can't yeah, believe I saw that. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot. Um, I still probably go back to um, probably the 2003 ALCS Red Sox Yankees, the Aaron Boone game. Um, that, that whole series was phenomenal. That game was unbelievable. Um, I would say that Red Sox Yankees, oh, you know, pretty much 03 to, you know, 03, 04, those two years are the most remarkable baseball games I've ever seen. Wow. Wow. That rivalry is something else, you know, for sure. And, uh, and we're going to see a rivalry like that this decade with the Dodgers and Padres. I mean, they've always been rivals, but yeah, my goodness, the Another talent, those, weekend. yes, the talent that those two teams have for the next 10 to 15 years. Oh my goodness. That's going to be, that could be better than the Yankees Red Sox. You think? That yeah, we'll see. Let's see when they deal the cards. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Wow. Well, Mr. Howard Bryant, such an honor and a privilege to have you on so much to talk about. I appreciate your time, sir. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. Thank you all for watching so much to talk about. Be safe, be well, and remember to treat each other with respect and kindness. Take care, everybody. God bless. Bye-bye.